my next guest, he was also on my podcast, and he just had an amazing story and a lot of sparkle and a lot of life and just so much belief and really power on the other side of drinking. And so much so that he is an entrepreneur at heart and he's gone to start kind of completely aside from his business, an entire community in the UK called Be Sober. And he's really um, impacted so many people and had himself written up in different newspapers and been say, making such a big impact. So please welcome to the stage, Simon Chappelle. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Hey, how's everyone doing? Great. Yeah, awesome. I wanted to say good morning, America. Just because <laughs> it felt good, right? <laughs> so who's feeling more positive about their life today than they were when they walked through those doors yesterday? Yeah, that's amazing. That's so cool. So as Annie said, I'm Simon Chappell and I'm the founder of Be Sober, and I'm also a senior coach for This Naked Mind. I live in the UK, near London, if you, in case you can't tell from my accent. <laughs> I went to Starbucks a couple of days ago, and uh, they put the name Solomon on my cup. <laughs> no, it's Simon. <laughs> so, I know some of you guys are in the Be Sober group. Who's in my group? <laughs> and why the hell are 80% of you not in my group? <laughs> And obviously I've coached some of you guys in the alcohol experiment, so it's really cool to actually be able to connect face to face. So thank you so much. So I started Be Sober as a website version of my journal. The first time I did the alcohol experiment, I was writing it down on pen and paper. And the second time I thought, I don't want to do that again, my wrist is aching. So I started a website. And I thought I wanted to get my feelings down and my emotions. And I started writing stories about the challenges I'd faced when I quit drinking. And people started visiting this website, who knew? And uh, then, yeah, then, then I've started a Facebook group and people started joining the Facebook group and now it's got over 5,000 members and it's one of the fastest growing online sober communities in the world. So if you're not a member of it, yeah, join Be Sober. <laughs> Now, as you can see, or you can't see, but you will see, since I quit drinking, I have never been so happy. I do star jumps everywhere I go. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to do too many now because my microphone will fall off. But if anyone wants to join me for a star jump session afterwards, I'm totally up for that. <laughs> but what I do want to do is share three things with you that I've learned since I quit drinking. And the first thing's to do with labels. I hear labels applied to ex-drinkers all the time, like alcoholic and in recovery. And for me, I don't identify as an alcoholic. And the term recovery makes me feel like we're sick or suffering from an illness or some kind of injury. If I was going to use a label for when I was drinking, it would be enthusiastic drinker. I'm, I'm all or nothing. I'm all or nothing with absolutely everything that I do. And it was no different when it came to drinking red wine. Who would describe themselves as an all or nothing type person? See, that does not surprise me. And, uh, <laughs> now, when you are an all, I think being an all or nothing person is almost like having a superpower. When you channel it into positive things like your family, running a business, your career, it's amazing. I've run 15 marathons because I couldn't just stop at 5K. So, <laughs> so that's great, um, other than my injured knee. But when you mix it with an addictive substance, it doesn't really work out very well. So I've kind of learned where to channel that all or nothing mentality. And it doesn't surprise me that about 90% of people put their hands up then. So the first thing I learned around, the, or the first thing I wanted to share with you, that was you've got the power to choose what labels you give. Some people like to use the term alcoholic, and that's totally fine. But you can be who you want to be in this. You don't have to let it define you. It can be, you can be whoever you want to be. You don't see people who quit smoking being given labels, or people who stop taking drugs being given labels. And I'm definitely not in recovery. Since I quit drinking, I've become the best version of myself that I've ever been. So why would I want to be in recovery? So my career with alcohol, let's talk about that. It started when I was about 14 or 15 years old. 
My dad used to drink this fancy French red wine called Beaujolais Nouveau, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to pester and pester him for a glass of it. And eventually he started letting me have a drink of it with my dinner. Before long, I was taking the remains of the bottle to my bedroom. And then I was getting my hands on my own alcohol and I was going to the pub underage with my friends. We live in a military town, so there's lots of young, fresh-faced recruits. So it was really easy to get served at the age of 15. And we were going in there two or three times a week. And if I'm honest, I think I was drinking to deal with feelings of loneliness, insecurity, and a growing sense of anxiety that was building up inside me. And then when I got to 25, that was when my drinking went to a whole new level. I'd moved in with my wife and we'd got our first house and I was drinking every single day. I was going to the shop at lunchtime, two or three bottles of wine to make sure I had a supply for the evening. Um, I was just like worried I was gonna run out of this stuff. And, and then I started drinking wine boxes because my, I was aware my wife was kind of picking up on how much I was drinking. And I thought, not just my wife, the neighbors, they, my, those, those, those wine bottles make a lot of noise in the recycling, right? <laughs> The boxes are just so easy to get rid of. <laughs> so, now, <laughs> so, the old me, I could never have stood on this stage. Um, I know some of you know, I used to suffer from a really, really bad anxiety. I wouldn't have even walked through that door. So the fact that I'm stood here, I hope tells you something. I used to work for a firm of solicitors. Now, none of you are gonna know what that word means, except for probably Laura, because she's from the UK. Um, it's law a firm of lawyers. And I was the marketing director for the company. And every month I had to do a marketing talk to 15 people, which is probably like those three tables there. And my anxiety got so bad that I had to say to the owner of the business, I just can't do this anymore. And I chose sitting in the corner like a timid mouse while he read my talk out because I preferred that embarrassment from the fear of having a panic attack. Uh, that was how bad my anxiety had got. It was just 10 or 15 people. And these days I run my own business, as Annie mentioned, and I, my anxiety built up inside me again. I was worrying about things that never happened. Who does that, worries about things that never happened, right? We all, we all do it. There's an amazing book called The Worry Trick, which really helped with my sense of worry. Definitely check that out. If you worry about stuff that doesn't happen, read The Worry Trick. So I was having a meltdown. If there was even a hint of a complaint or a problem with a client or a staff member, and I got to a stage where the same thing happened that happened at the lawyers, I said, I just can't do this anymore. It's all just too much for me. So I took some time out. I, I set the business up so it could run itself, and I took some time away to find some headspace. And it was during that time that I discovered this naked mind, and I connected with Annie, and that was where I managed to change my life. But here's the thing. Before I did that, I went to doctors about my anxiety, I went to counsellors about it, I went to hypnotherapists. Not one of them dug into my drinking, other than the doctor. He asked me how much I drank, and I lied. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently doctors actually double the amount that people tell them to get to the true figure, so I've heard. <laughs> so he actually would have had to have times mine by about four, but... <laughs> So three or four months after I quit drinking, these dark clouds of anxiety that had been over me for all these years, they started fading away and the sun started to shine again. I didn't even know what was going on. I was suddenly smiling for the first time in 25 years. I thought I was destined just to become a grumpy old man. <laughs> and there I was, I was laughing naturally and smiling and connecting with my son again. And it was just the most amazing feeling. So this is the second thing that I've learned. I feel like I'm walking, talking evidence that cutting alcohol out of your life can cure your anxiety and it can deal with depression. And it's so, so true. And so many people in the groups that I work in tell me that their anxiety has improved and faded. I just wanted to get a show of hands because I know people are on different stages in the journey, but who perhaps who's cut alcohol out of their life for maybe a month or two months, has seen a positive difference in their anxiety. Look at, oh my God, look at that. That is unbelievable. So if you're early in this journey, 
you don't need any more evidence than that. And if you, you know, if you suffer from anxiety like I did, and clearly a lot of us did, that it shows you. It's, alcohol, for me, was the fuel on the fire of anxiety. And I'm, it's not just the anxiety. I feel like I'm so much more mentally resilient and tough these days. I'm calmer and more grounded, and I can deal with things better. So a few months ago, my son had some challenges in his life with his sexuality and his gender. The old drink in me would have been a nightmare to deal with it. I would have probably just broken open another bottle of Shiraz or been argumentative and difficult to deal with. But I connected with him. We've gone on a journey together. We've hugged and I've been a proper dad. Sorry, it choked me up just <laughs> thinking about it. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and, it's, and I've approached it with a sense of positivity. And now in my life, when things scare me, I try and reframe them and think about it from a perspective of the positive outcome. This, this scares me, you know, standing here today, but I want to share. And I, I, I know that this is my calling and what I want to do in my life. So, yeah, I'm much more grounded and resilient. So that's the other gift that I've had from sobriety. I'm just to pause a minute about the word sober and sobriety. I know some people don't like that, and I talked a little bit about labels. For me, the word sober, and my group's called Be Sober, for me, the word sober is more than just not drinking. It's a lifestyle choice and a journey of self-discovery and self-improvement, and I see it as a whole sort of, a whole picture of things. So, but again, you can be who you want to be in this, sober, alcoholic, recovery, enthusiastic drinker, whatever you want to be. So. <laughs> um, so, so the only reason I quit drinking, really, was because I didn't want to die before the age of 50. A friend of mine died when he was 47 from liver disease, and it really woke me up to the dangers of alcohol. But I found it to be the gift that keeps on giving. It's like Christmas all the time, uh, both internally and externally. So my mental health is so much better. I used to have massive dark bags under my eyes. My skin has improved. My eyes are better. My hair has not grown back. <laughs> it's going to happen. I'm going to have a big... Uh, and, and next year's this naked mind, I'll have an afro. <laughs> and also my relationship with my wife, my son, my productivity, my levels of motivation, my energy. I'm doing star jumps, you know. I, I, the difference is just amazing, uh, and it just keeps on giving so many amazing and positive things. So when I quit drinking, here's some words of advice. <laughs> Don't do what I did. When I quit drinking, I shouted it from the rooftops. I thought I'd discovered this key to happiness, so I thought I should tell everybody. <laughs> I put it all over Facebook, I put it all over Instagram, and I told anybody who'd listen, quit drinking, it's the key to happiness, it's the magic formula, you need to do this. Some people thought I'd turned into a crazy, sober preacher. Um, and mo but to be fair, most of the reactions were positive. People said, well done, how did you do it? But I also had some negative reactions, and this is the sort of words of advice I wanted to give around that. I got called boring, I got told it wouldn't last, so do keep your guard up when you start talking openly about this, because you may get the odd adverse reaction. And I think the only thing I would do differently is I would have put together a strategy. I would have told my closest circle of trust, my wife and maybe one or two close friends, and then when I felt ready, I would have gradually broadened that circle out wider. So have a think about a strategy that would work for you, that you would feel confident in doing. Don't just jump in and blast it from the rooftops like I did because it can catch you off guard when somebody says something. So I thought about these comments and I thought, what, you know, why do they feel the need to be negative about something that is so important and in my mind so positive? And I realized it's not me, it's not anything that I've done or I've said, it's them. Yeah, they're the ones with the problem, <laughs> right? And then I thought, no, it's not them. It's the alcohol. It's all coming from the alcohol. And I realised what it had done. It had made these people hold a mirror up to their own relationship with drinking. And they probably didn't like what they saw when they looked in that mirror. And it, they probably thought as well I was judging them and maybe sort of saying, I'm better than you, I don't drink. But 
that's absolutely not what I was doing, and I'm sure none of us judge. The people I meet in the sober community are the least judgmental people I've ever met, so I know that that's definitely not a thing, but they may have thought I was judging them. And worst of all, they probably thought they were losing a friend and a drinking buddy. Our relationships were based all around alcohol, so they might have thought, well, if we're not drinking, he's not going to be a friend anymore. So I kind of just stepped back from that and let it wash over me. So the other thing is, if you do happen to get any negative comments or reactions, just don't respond to them. It's not them talking, it's the booze and their relationship with it. Right, so the third thing, I said I'd share three things. The third thing I learned is that alcohol freedom is contagious. You can catch it like you can catch a cold or the flu. So, and I discovered this in the strangest of places. I had a, a couple of, it was probably a week or two after I quit drinking, I had a conversation with my teenage son. We've always been very open and dis, really, oh, we've got a really good open flu, fluid, that's not the right word, just an open relationship. Um, uh, luckily, my wife and I haven't got an open relationship, by the way. <laughs> that was also the wrong word. Um, and he, I sat him down and I, I said to him, look, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it. And I just wanted to arm him with the facts. I didn't want to sort of ram my views down his throat, but I just wanted him to be on side and I wanted to have some support from him. And thankfully, uh, he was really supportive of me. Um, he sent me a really fun, I was, it was too late to put it on the slides, but he sent me a text before I came on stage. There was a picture of a pint of beer with a cross next to it and a picture of a glass of water with a tick next to it. <laughs> um, anyway, so I had this conversation with him and that was all good. The next day, he comes running into the kitchen. Dad, Dad, I've downloaded the I Am Sober app. Um, for those of you who don't know, the I Am Sober app allows you to count the days when you quit drinking. Some people love them, those sort of apps. Some people don't get on with them. They're definitely worth trying out. I still have mine on my phone, but I only really look at it on the big anniversaries and milestones. So he came running into the kitchen. Dad, Dad, I've downloaded this app. I was like, what the hell have you downloaded that for? You don't drink alcohol. And he said to me, this is absolutely truthful. He said to me, you've quit drinking alcohol, Dad. I'm giving up fizzy soda drinks. Uh, <laughs> and it, uh, and he's still got the app on his phone to this day. Now, he has had a couple of slip-ups with Dr. Pepper. <laughs> but he's learned from them and he's grown stronger. <laughs> but this, this is when I started to realise it's contagious. I talked to my son about it, and clearly it had an impact on him in some kind of strange way. <laughs> but then people started contacting me. I started hearing from friends who I hadn't spoken to since I was at school, and closer friends telling me that they were worried about their drinking, and how did I quit? So I started to help them, started to share the book with them and tell them about the alcohol experiment give them some of the tools that I'd used on my journey. And I hear it all the time in the groups that I work in, that when people come out, now I have to pause here, I love that phrase, come out. Who's come out? <laughs> Can you believe we have to come out? <laughs> I hear it all the time in, in the groups I work in, that when people come out, they start to get contacted by other people. They start to inspire other people by talking openly about it. And it seems to me that there are so many people who are aware they've got a problem, but they just don't know what to do about it. And when somebody opens up about this, it's almost like they see a beacon of hope, an opportunity to talk. And this will happen to you, I promise, if it hasn't already, you will start to inspire other people on this journey. I used to look at the likes of Scott and Annie and Laura and people who had been sober for a long time as if they were like some kind of superhero. I put them up on a pedestal and used to think to myself, how the hell have they done this? I can't go one day without drinking. Just the thought of not having a wine box in the cupboard would put a knot in my stomach. Yet there they were. They'd quit alcohol, they'd turned their lives around and changed everything, yet they used to be in the same trap that I was in. I remember on one occasion, I'd had probably 20 attempts at my day one, and I'd actually made it through a whole day of not drinking. It was incredible. <laughs> Don't clap that, it doesn't deserve clapping. <laughs> and it was the second day, this was big for me, and my wife and I went for a run. We, we do a lot of running. And we were running down this country lane, and my head was in absolute turmoil. 
one half, I don't know if it was this side or this side, but we'll say it's this side. One half was saying to me, Simon, you deserve, you, you've had a stressful day at work, you deserve a drink. You didn't drink yesterday, have a drink. Then this half was saying to me, you're putting in the work to be alcohol free. You're trying to change your life, don't have a drink. And it was like a big washing machine spinning round. And I started talking to my wife about it. And as I was talking, I burst into tears. And the next thing I knew, this is going to choke me up as well. The next thing I knew, I was stood there with her hugging me in the street, just crying my eyes out. And uh, I did drink that night, by the way. But here's the thing. I kept doing the work. I kept putting the work in. And this, believe me, this is the key. It's all about the knowledge and putting the work in. You get out what you put in. And over time, and it did take a bit of time, my mindset shifted and I slowly moved to a place where I felt like I just don't want to drink any longer. It wasn't that I couldn't have a drink or felt deprived, I just didn't want one. Alcohol became small and insignificant in my life. And then as the months continued rolling by, I was helping more and more people on their journey and I realised that actually I was becoming a bit like one of those superheroes that I put on a pedestal. <laughs> But the same thing will happen to you. As you move forward in this journey, people who are early on or are questioning their relationship with alcohol will start to look at you like a superhero. But you've got to put yourself first in this. It's really important. You will inspire other people, but make sure you do these things at a time that's right for you. But I found the more people I was helping on the journey, the more accountable I became. I kind of felt responsible for all these people I'd helped. I didn't want them to fall down. And it felt like we were all holding hands and walking on this path towards freedom. It was a little bit like I'd thrown a rock into a pond and the ripples had gone out and touched so many people. And the more people it touched, the more accountable I became, the stronger I became, the more eyes there were on me. And it was like I'd built this tribe around me. Now, it can be tempting to make an excuse when you start drinking. You might be going to a party or out with friends and you might say, I'm on medication, so I'm not drinking, or I'm driving, so I can't drink. I've always been, as I told you, very open and honest about my story and my journey. And I always felt if I made an excuse, people might be deprived of the opportunity to talk. They may never have seen that beacon of hope that I mentioned earlier. And you'll, you will start to inspire other people when you start talking about this. You've got to do what's right for you at a time that's right for you. And excuses can be amazing early on in the journey. But at some point, you are going to want to talk openly about this and be completely true to yourself. And this impacts your kids as well. There's my son. Oh, no, you can't see him. But there's my son. He's the, he's the one with the hair, <laughs> just to be clear. So this impacts your kids too. So I said I had a really grown-up conversation with my teenage son. He saw me drink for, my, for his entire life. Every single day, he saw me with a glass of red wine in my hand. Now, I've been very open with him, and I've armed him with the facts. I just want him to make his own choices. And I, I feel he's changed the way he thinks about alcohol. He's seen me from both sides. He's seen the drink in me, and he's seen the sober me. And he's told me in no uncertain terms which version he prefers. A couple of months ago, he was staying at his friend's house and he sent me a text message and it said, Dad, my friend's just got out of a bottle of gin. They're drinking it. I'm not going to have any. I'm not interested and I don't want to let you down. And it took me back because I thought, so if I hadn't quit drinking, would you have had some of that gin? But I realised that I'm sure he'll explore alcohol and he'll go on his own journey. I feel like I've kind of set him up for success by talking openly with him. And he's free to make his own decisions, but with some extra knowledge that he might never have had. And maybe he will become a sober ninja. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what a sober ninja is. And the truth is, I just, I just wanted to put a picture of me in a skirt with a sword. And, <laughs> and I thought, how the hell am I going to get that into my slides? <laughs> But seriously, do tell your kids and talk to your kids because they learn from us. I often hear people in the groups saying to me, I've drunk for 20 years, the damage is done, I can't change anything. And that is absolute 
BS, because you can. My son saw me drinking every day for his entire life. He's changed, he's learned. It's the now, the now that matters. And your kids will see what you're doing now and they become inspired by it. So do please, please do not think, what's the point in changing? They already just think I'm this, they think I'm that, because it, it's so powerful and they can become part of your support team as well. He's a massive part of my support team. So we're, we are a very, very small percentage of people in the Western world who consciously choose not to drink. To me, it feels like a really exclusive club, which is why I think it's kind of hard to get entry at the start. <laughs> <laughs> But we've gone against everything that society's taught us, everything our culture has dictated to us, all the marketing messages that we've received, the learned behaviour from our friends and our peers and our parents. So I talked about labels at the start. I feel like I've found magic in my life, peace, freedom, happiness. I haven't lost anything. And I know at the start it can feel like you are giving something up. Believe me, I've not lost anything. I've gained absolutely everything. So one label I love, and I know it's been mentioned a few times, is Sober Rebels. It's one of my favourites. And I think everybody here is a rebel and a superhero for doing something so proactive and so powerful. I think at the next live, I saw there was a merchandise stand out there. We should have Annie get us some Hell's Angels jackets with Sober Rebels on the back. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty cool. And also, Katie made me... Where's Katie? Are you here? Yeah, yeah, I didn't, couldn't see you because of the light. Katie made me a sober superhero cape. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was going to wear it, but I thought there might be a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> so I'll wear it tonight in my room. <laughs> now the most important thing in all of this and it's really easy for me to say it but is to in, don't forget to enjoy the ride if I could have seen everything all the positive changes and everything that's happened to me ahead of time when I was there on day two crying in the street it would have just been so easy if I'd known all these gifts that were going to be coming my way but it is worth getting enthusiastic about. It's one of the most positive and pow most powerful changes you can make to your life. And if you could see, and I know some of you already see what those gifts, but if you could see what lay ahead of you, you wouldn't be approaching this with any sense of fear. You'd be like a kid on Christmas Eve because it really is worth getting excited about. And that's why I jump up and down about it because it's so amazingly powerful. So just to summarise, the three things that... I've learned since I quit drinking are we've got the power to choose our own labels. You can be whoever you want to be. If you want to be an alcoholic, be an alcoholic. If you want to be an enthusiastic ex-drinker, be one of those. Without alcohol in my life, I no longer have anxiety, which is amazing. <laughs> and alcohol freedom is contagious. You're going to inspire other people and it's an amazing feeling when that happens. So if anyone's got any questions about what I've talked about, definitely connect with me. I'm around for the rest of the day and I'd love to talk. And finally, I just wanted to say thank you for letting me be part of your journey. It really means a lot. So thank you so much for listening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>